So we just saw some videos on how Canada processes its, you know, 300 to 400,000 immigrants and how we differ with the American system as well. <coughs> All those videos are available and accessible to you from this PowerPoint, which is on Google Classroom. Um, so the part of immigration in Canada, which is economic, aims to support, aims to meet Canada's workforce needs by, you know, ideally bringing in people who strengthen and support our economic growth. So maybe skilled workers. Additionally, a uh, point I already mentioned, so our, our birth rates are declining just like many other uh, modern wealthy countries or westernized countries. Um, I kind of talked about this in my grade 10 class, but as it's been noted that as countries get wealthier, as a society gets wealthier, they have less children. As they industrialize, as they modernize their technology, people tend to have less children which uh, for some countries, like I've heard for South Korea, they're at a very low birth rate, which means they have an aging population. And so things like old age pension, your old age security, whatever it's called in various countries, a lot of those systems won't work if there's not enough young people uh, putting into the system. Um, and you know, that can be a, uh, problem for aging populations, aging countries. Additionally, some places, so I would assume South Korea is very homogenous. I'm, I'm assuming if you go to South Korea, you're mostly just going to see South Koreans. And, you know, when you rely heavily on immigration, it dramatically changes the, the let's say, cultural makeup of those societies. So listened to a podcast on this and one thing uh, the guy mentioned was that um, you know in different parts of the world they have different beliefs on how you know the role of gen the role of gender so what should men do in the household what should women do in the household they have different views on you know who should be allowed to participate in society and to what extent and so in in North America let's say or Europe you know we have Charter rights and freedoms. We believe in equality between the, the between the sexes. And if you're bringing in people from parts of the world that don't have that same belief, it's going to you know cause that status quo to shift. If you're bringing in, if you're adding in influences that think, well, not everyone should be allowed to vote. Not everyone is equal. Not everyone should be treated the same. Uh, it's going to rapidly change how that society functions. So this is kind of the argument that this person was, this was uh, the arguments that this person was using uh, in, in, to make the case for having more children. You know, particularly if you have beliefs that are beliefs of equality, of freedom, that people should be treated the same and whatnot. So, so some countries, I know, I know there was one. Um, European country, I don't know, I don't remember exactly which one, but they were incentivizing the local population to have children by providing tax benefits to mothers who had uh, children. So I think if a woman in that country had given birth to four children, she would essentially pay no income tax, which is pretty sweet. You know, if that woman chooses to work later in life, or if you have one child, 25% reduction in your income tax, right? which hopefully then benefits the household as well and not just single parent families running around, yes. I think it was Finland who had that since it was such a big Finland, yeah. perhaps. It could have been a Scandinavian country. I think more European countries are doing that now. It wouldn't surprise me if it was one of the Scandinavian countries because yeah, they're, they're, their birth rate is just plummeting next to nothing. Um, and so obviously, you know, any rule you implement is gonna have unintended consequences that you didn't expect. So for example, China had an opposite problem in the last 50 to 70 years. Their population was too much, and so the, the government structure at the time, they in 
enforce the rule. They called it the one child policy. And they said all families can only have one child. What they didn't account for is that much of China's population was rural and they were impoverished, so they were very poor. And so an unintended consequence of the one child policy was that a lot of people in the countryside, they would either hide their children or kill their female children because they didn't want to lose their child and, and have to like give away their child when they got married. And so that one dramatically negatively impacted the population and some people um, speculate that China's population is a lot lower than we actually think. And they're also an aging population and then they're also more males than females, which produces other societal problems which have been studied and well noted in, 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 in the past. And so, um, so yeah, if there's countries that are pushing policies that you know promote people to have more children, anything you do, any major policy you put into place, or even small policies will have unintended consequences that you might not anticipate. Uh, and so, you know, um, immigration is one way that countries will suggest to deal with this population pro problem. Oh, Canadians aren't having enough kids? Well, we'll just bring in more people from all around the world. Again, that dramatically shifts the cultural atmosphere of Canada. And what I mean by that is, again, you know, if you have people that believe different things about the role of genders and the role of sexes, and who should be allowed to participate in society can dramatically change how that is. Again, I would point to the example of my own country, Pakistan, in which they um, put into their constitution, into their charter, that certain religious groups uh, are not Muslim and shouldn't be allowed to express their beliefs in public. I mean, just imagine if we did something like that now in Canada, it would be terrible. point just adds on to what we're already discussing. Uh, I'm just going to skip over this video. Okay. So in Canada for immigration we have a point system. Okay. It began in 1967 and it applies only to economic immigrants. So only if you're coming here to work and to move here due to that. Um, this does not apply to refugee or family class immigrants. Those are slightly different. So there's six factors. There's English and French language skill. There is education, your work experience, age, uh, whether or not you have employment and your perceived adaptability. Okay, so knowing those six categories is likely going to be useful for you. Again, you already have this PowerPoint uh, given to you. Uh, part of the challenge with immigration is that if you're coming to Canada, you have to prove to some degree that you are in good health, right? So that we avoid people who might just be coming here to get health care for a short amount of time and then just leave. So, you know, that would be seen as perhaps siphoning out of our system, taking the good and then leaving with the good and, you know, not returning anything back to Canadian society. So you can be refused entry if you have a contagious disease, uh, if you have a condition that can endanger public safety, uh, their health could put too much demand on the healthcare system. So, you know, something like HIV, AIDS, perhaps cancer, or some other very uh, specific uh, Just don't tell issue. them that you have cancer. They can run the test. I think that would be, uh, you, you have to provide a medical test, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> What if you like, hide your cancer? What if you cut it out? How do you hide you the cancer? And then eat it when you What? Eat it. Ew. Why would you eat it out? Uh, well, let's Why stay on topic here, boys and girls. Assert dominance. Assert dominance. Ew. Boys, thank you. Um, if you're coming here, like, so if you're bringing your parents here, or your spouse here, um, you would be able to skip that health screening if you're coming here as a refugee. Which is kind of fascinating. 
Uh, the refugee part makes sense. I mean, again, if you're doing something charitable to bring people to your country and provide them a better quality of life, that makes sense. You can't just be like, oh, you're in a war-torn country and you're you're an amputee or you have some sort of disease because something terrible happened to you. Tough luck, you're gonna be too much of a burden on the system. Stay where you are. Um, the family class portion is a little bit more complicated, but I'm assuming because at least one person is working and they're putting into the system that maybe there's some more allowances there. a whole lot of CBC articles, kids. You can watch on your own time. Okay. So ideally, our policies evolve with the ever-changing needs of society. Um, you know, if we just operated on our first immigration policies, they would be very racist and very <laughs> terrible and nobody would be allowed in and might be a horrible place to live. Um, <clears throat> So according to that act in 2002 that we kind of brought up earlier, uh, so again, people who are spying on a government or trying to overthrow or subvert the government, they're not allowed into the country for obvious reasons. People who have committed acts of terrorism, anyone who might take part in acts of violence that would endanger people. So we're doing our best, allegedly, to screen out people who would be a problem for Canada. I feel like if somebody's spying on Canada, they're not going to let you know that they're spying on Canada. Sure, it's uh, our job to um, screen people to make sure that they're not giving